think about starting. This is the uh, webinar of the Australian Nuclear Association um, featuring Dr. Edward Bard from the University of New South Wales. On the bottom of the screen will be a set of questions and answers that um, give you a chance to, a place to, I guess, put questions and answers, which we'll go to at, at the end of the talk. Um, I think we'll invite Dr. Mark Ho to introduce Ed and to manage the webinar. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, John. Uh, yes, so we're very honoured here today uh, to have Senior Lecturer Dr. Ed Obard from the University of New South Wales giving a presentation for us. So um, Ed actually worked at ANSO as well, but before uh, he was uh, at ANSO, he actually got his PhD over in China, I believe, Ed uh, gained fluency in, in Mandarin whilst he was studying for his PhD in China at the Chinese Academy of Science, specialising uh, materials research. And before then, he was also at the uh, University of Nottingham, uh, also you know, studying materials science and uh, mechanical design. So, so Ed uh, specializes in nuclear materials research, uh, but he also does research in the development of uh, VR tools, meaning virtual reality tools for um, remote handling of nuclear materials and also uh, in the development of blockchain technology for the tracking of nuclear materials as well. Uh, so um, at ANSTO, Ed was responsible also for the design of uh, various cells, uh, which were designed and I, I believe he project managed that, that uh, research, uh, sorry, that project uh, for, um, for, for, for supporting uh, research into nuclear materials uh, before going on to, to UNSW. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ed, if you'd like to take it, take it away and uh, give us a presentation on the blockchain technology. Thanks. Right, um, thanks, Mark. <laughs> so hello, everyone, nice, nice to see you. Uh, well, so this is gonna be about um, a tool which we made at UNSW for uh, nuclear materials accounting, which is part of nuclear safeguards. Um, so I thought by way of starting things off, we better just clear up what, what safeguards are. And to do that, I've actually got a little video which we made as part of one of our um, nuclear engineering courses. So I'm gonna share that first, okay? It's three or four minutes long, the safeguards bit. Um, so we'll go straight to that and then we'll do my slides later, okay? so. If we find the uh, video, where, where's it gone? Here we go. And I'm just going to play this for you. Nuclear safeguards. In the 1950s and 1960s, the United States, the Soviet Union, France, the United Kingdom and China repeatedly tested nuclear explosives and became nuclear weapon states. The cost and other barriers to acquiring nuclear weapons was falling for all states. On March 21st, 1963, US President John F. Kennedy's words reflected the mood when he said, I see the possibility in the 1970s of the President of the United States having to face a world in which 15 or 20 or 25 nations may have nuclear weapons. I regard that as the greatest possible danger and hazard. Potentially, more and more states would soon possess nuclear weapons. How could the states of the world reduce the risk that nuclear weapons would be used and reduce the risk of actual nuclear war from spiralling out of control? Against this backdrop, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons was created. It defines the states of the world as nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. The nuclear weapon states agree to pursue eventual nuclear disarmament. The non-nuclear weapon states agree to forego any attempt to develop or acquire nuclear weapons. All signatories are granted an inalienable right to the development of nuclear technologies for peaceful purposes, including the sharing of civil nuclear technologies and helping each other in trade, in advice, and in other collaborative work to facilitate peaceful uses. Much of these activities form the work of the International Atomic Energy Agency. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force in March 1970 and was indefinitely extended in 1995. It is one of the most successful arms agreements ever, with near-universal membership. 
By way of enforcing the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the non-nuclear weapon states agreed to accept International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards. This is what we mean by nuclear safeguards. Certain fissionable nuclear materials, such as enriched uranium and plutonium, can be used to fuel either reactors or weapons. Therefore, some parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, such as enrichment and reprocessing, have dual uses. They apply to civilian and to military purposes. The purpose of nuclear safeguards is to verify that all the nuclear materials in a state are being used for peaceful purposes. Safeguards consist firstly of reporting by the state to the International Atomic Energy Agency of the inventory and the location of all nuclear materials. Secondly, the International Atomic Energy Agency will conduct inspections in the nuclear facilities of the state to ensure that what states report is in fact true. This might be through physical verifications by IAEA inspectors or remote surveillance. This allows states to demonstrate their adherence to commitments to the international community that they made under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nuclear safeguards are the obligations of signatories to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. They include the processes, the nuclear material accounting systems and associated logical and legal frameworks used by the International Atomic Energy Agency to demonstrate that nuclear materials are being used for peaceful purposes. Today... So, there we go, that was nice. So that, that's, that's nuclear safeguards for you. Um, so that's a really important backdrop to the rest of the talk, okay? Because now we've got an idea that nuclear safeguards are about reporting inventories of material to our national regulators, and also about the national regulators then reporting inventories, well, national inventories of nuclear materials to an international um, body, which is the Atomic Energy Agency. And then that they also, uh, well, they in turn conduct inspections back in the, in the states that do the reporting to verify that the inventories of materials, the locations of nuclear materials, of nuclear material, sorry, I should say, um, is is true. So that's really where we started having the idea of using blockchain in this application. So I'll go to my uh, slides. Here we go. Um, there, this is the beginning. Here we are. <laughs> um, so, so if we're if we're thinking about nuclear safeguards, right? A, a central part of nuclear safeguards is um, is reporting, is materials accounting and reporting of inventories and batches of materials and where they are, and doing that reliably, and doing that in a way that cannot be falsified by any of the parties involved, and doing that in a way that uh, is going to increase trust between the different stakeholders as well. That's really important. And uh, traditionally, the way that nuclear materials accounting and reporting has taken place is with a completely, a completely hierarchical structure in which the different nuclear facilities report their inventories up to a national regulator and then the national regulator would then report that up to this international body. So in this context we were aware of blockchain technology. Okay so blockchain is a way of um, really just a, w a way of storing information in a way that it cannot be modified. So if you like to think of an analogy, it's like going back to paper-based records, okay? It's like going back to append-only records, um, which cannot be modified without seeing the marks of the rubber on the page. Uh, because in a way, that's something we've lost, right, when things have become increasingly electronic. Um, so what, what is blockchain and how does it work? Well, it depends on an idea uh, which is hashing algorithms. Well, it's not just an idea, it's actually a, um, a, a, a system in, in software engineering. So a hashing algorithm takes an input like any, any string of data, any file, any could be an image, just basically any structured data. Um, so input X and using a hashing algorithm con converts it to an output. And this output has fixed length and is completely unique for um, the input. And most crucially, you cannot reverse engineer the input from the output. So although the output is, is unique, and if you change any one letter in the input, it will change this output, um, 
unless you use extremely computationally expensive brute force kind of approaches, you cannot infer what the input was from, from the output. So you cannot reverse engineer a hash. So using this clever property of hashes, you can come up with a, with a data structure, okay, called a blockchain. So what all a blockchain is, is it's blocks of data, okay? And the blocks of data are linked together by, by each other's hash. So you can see if I've got block one, okay, um, with transactions stored in it, let me use, a, I can use a pen actually. So if I've got block one, okay, with transactions stored in it, um, then uh, I can make a hash of that previous block and store it along with some more data such as transactions in block two, okay? And then I can make another hash of block two, so that's previous hash, and store it along with some more transactions in block three. So what I'm doing is I'm building up this chain of blocks, <laughs> this, this structured chain of data in which each part of the data is linked to the last bit, okay? And because of this property of hashes, because I've hashed block two and stored the hash in block three, any modification in block two is going to show up in that it doesn't match the hash, okay? But I can't, if I'm a, some malicious actor and I want to modify the transaction in block two, I cannot then modify the hash in block three to make up for that because then it wouldn't match, the ha it wouldn't match block three's hash in block four, see? So this is the idea of the chain. It's this chain of blocks. And because they're all connected together by their hashes, you can't modify one of them. In fact, you'd have to modify all of them. And clearly that would be visible. Okay, another aspect of the blockchain is that um, not only can I store actual transactions in the blockchain, I can also use it to reference hashes for transactions that are stored elsewhere. Okay, so I, if the data is larger, I can store transaction information and maybe image data, video data, things like that somewhere else, and then just store the hash of this data in my blocks. So I don't actually have to store everything inside the blocks. And this property of immutability, okay, it's called, it's actually called practical immutability. It's not real immutability because, of course, it's just data on a hard drive. But in practice, it becomes immutable because anyone can verify if it's been modified. So that's the first thing to understand about blockchain. The second step to understand is because we have this ledger, which is now definitive and immutable, it means that we can share it with other participants. So if you know that I can't modify the ledger, then you don't mind sharing it with me because you trust that I cannot then modify it to serve my whatever strange purposes I may have. So that's the other thing about blockchain is that it's distributed. It's a distributed data structure and it's also immutable. Um, oh, that's an animation showing, look, if I try to modify these transactions, the, block, the hashes won't match up and the blockchain is conferred a practical immutability. Okay, so we applied this idea. Um, well, it's not just an idea, it's more than that. It's just um, technology, I suppose. It's software technology. Yeah, we applied this software technology to um, a tracking database for nuclear materials. And we did this in 2018. And as a inspiration for this we were actually using numbat because at the university of new south wales we have numbat so numbat okay for those who don't know numbat is the is stands for nuclear material balance and tracking there's numbat and it was developed by asno the australian safeguards and non-proliferation office um, for tracking nuclear materials in australia and, and we knew the functions the basic functions of numbat and we thought well why don't we make a shared ledger numbat so we said, okay, we did this. And that's Edward. There's Edward. He's, he was my student at the time. And he, he made Slumbat, which is Shared Ledger Numbat. Okay. And it's really based on recording information about batches of nuclear material um, transacted by different participants in a supply chain. And it's structured to reflect the nuclear materials report, the nuclear material reporting structure, including holders of nuclear material. Uh, national regulators and an international regulator and it had we found that it had these particular features when you use blockchain to do a job like this you inherently transit match your batches which means uh, because uh, assets on a blockchain are not fungible um, 
it means that if I send you something, I have to lose it so that you can ret so that you can have it. Right? It's not just an accounting number; it's actually like an entity, uh, and that means that it naturally enforces transit matching, which is very useful in safeguards land, because the Atomic Energy Agency uses an awful lot of effort trying to match up um, accounting reports from different participants, and so that was one thing. And so, yeah, we first tested it at UNSW with some local nuclear safeguards professionals and some people from, from ANSTO as well, actually. In, so nuclear safeguards professionals include some ANSTO people. I, I wonder if they're watching. I hope it'd be nice if they are. <laughs> um, and then, so Slumbat, Slumbat went places, right? So we, um, we went to the Atomic Energy Agency Symposium on International Safeguards in 2018. And somewhere here, I think that's Edward there. So Edward, not this Edward, Edward, student Edward, telling the Atomic Energy Agency about Slumbat in 2018 for his um, honours thesis, which was kind of exciting. Uh, and then through that, we met Cindy Vestergaard from the Stimson Centre. And Cindy, uh, well, with Cindy, we did this workshop in Vienna um, called Evaluating Blockchain for Safeguards. And Slumbat was the demonstration of a blockchain safeguard uh, materials accounting system there. And, and as a result of that, we then ended up building uh, a demo slumbat, which we called Slavka, for Stuck. And Stuck is the Finnish Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority, so a bit like ASNO in um, in Finland, because they Stuck wanted uh, their own demonstration of slumbat uh, to try with their with their operators and their nuclear safeguards people. So that's a picture of us in Finland when we just started building what we called Slavka. And so Slavka is another name a bit like Slumbat because they have a thing called Safka, which they use for reporting nuclear material. And so this was shared ledger Safka that we built for them. Uh, this is a quick slide telling you some information about nuclear safeguards in Finland. Um, the most important thing here is Finland is building the world's first repository for high-level nuclear waste at the Oikoloto nuclear power plant. And so this is one of the reasons why Stuck, the Finnish regulator, was so interested in blockchain for nuclear safeguards, because it's potentially a way for storing, in, for storing records about uh, batches of nuclear material in a repository that cannot be physically verified. So if you cannot physically verify something in a deep geological repository, it becomes increasingly important to trust the records you have of that material for a long time. And that's also one of the, potentially one of the attributes of blockchain is again, because this ledger is immutable and distributed, it makes it a very resilient way to store information. So what is Slavka? What, what was this thing that we built for Finland? Um, Slavka is a prototype distributed ledger technology um, platform in collaboration with these people. And it's built using Hyperledger Fabric. And Hyperledger Fabric is an open source uh, set of blockchain tools. And importantly, so there's various ones. There's Ethereum, there's, um, there's Bitcoin. <laughs> We've all heard of Bitcoin, right? Um, Hyperledger Fabric is slightly special because it enables um, permissions. It's what's called a private blockchain. So it's a blockchain which is not open to everyone. It's not public. Uh, you can apply permissions just like you can have file permissions in a, in a Unix operating system. You can specify who has read-write permissions over the data and who has um, different execute permissions to execute certain transactions. And that was really important to us because Safeguards is not a public system. It needs to be private. And Hyperledger Fabric gave us that um, gave us that potential. This is a screenshot of the Slavka user interface, um, uh, and that's the Slavka page. That's actually Slavka.org. Um, so Slavka's running; it's real; it exists. Um, it's a uh, it's a demo which people can try. Um, and so now I'm just going to run through uh, a, a little story. So it's. It's super short, right? In fact, in Finland in March, that was quite exciting. We just came back under the wire just when coronavirus was blowing up. Um, but just before we went to Finland in March, um, that, so that was me, Edward Yu, who stayed on as a research assistant to help develop um, 
Slavka and also Cindy Vestergaard from Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, we went to present Slavka to Stuck in March in Finland, and we ran through a very long scenario, right, of all things that they might want to do with nuclear material in Finland. But what I'm going to show you now is just some really uh, collapsed steps of that um, relating to shipment domestic and receipt domestic of nuclear material. So, so shipment domestic, what do we want to do? So here we have a, here we have a holder of nuclear material called FT Power. And FT Power has a batch in materials balance area 001. And they want to send it to PVO, which is another nuclear operator in Finland. Both of these participants are within the jurisdiction of FINREG, who's the Finnish nuclear regulator. Uh, so how does so to do this transaction, what, what we want to say is, well, what I want to show you is what does this transaction look like in Slavka? So here's what it looks like. So this is what the Slavka user interface looks like. Uh, and so to ship a batch, you select the batch. There you go. I'm selecting batch five and you say ship domestic. Okay. And when you say ship domestic, you get a, uh, some options. So it, I've already selected batch five and I select a destination. So the destination of this batch is going to be the operator called PVO. Uh, and the current location of the batch is um, shown above that. So when I execute that transaction, so me as FT Power can now see that batch five is in transit. And it's also not verified by the regulator because I've transacted it, it becomes unverified. Uh, and then I've got a little message up there saying um, shipment domestic successful in transit uh, to PVO. Okay, so next PVO, who's this participant here, wants to receive that batch that's been shipped to them and put it into their materials balance area 002. So the, the next slide is going to show um, what that looks like to someone using Slavka. So here I'm logged in as PVO. Uh, and oh, no, I'm not. Now I'm logging in as PVO. So if I log in as PVO, there we go, I get a notification saying that FT Power has sent me a batch. So if I use that notification, now I can see the details of the batch that's been sent. There it is. Um, and I can choose where to put it, right? I can choose which MBA and KMP to put it in because now it's in my, it's in my jurisdiction. Uh, and there are some details of the batch that I'm receiving. There we go. So now I'm PVO and I can see here's the batch, right? Here's the batch that's just been sent to me. And I'm the owner now. So the owner has changed because um, it, it's not owned by FT Power anymore. It's owned by me and it's not verified by the regulator. N notably, so all so the as PVO, the owner of all my batches is PVO because, of course, I can't see anyone else's batches. But if I was logged in as the regulator here, then I could see batches owned by different people. So finally, FINREG wants to verify this batch. So let's see how Slavka looks from the point of view of a regulator who needs to verify that the batch is um, indeed what it is and where it says it is. So now we log in as FINREG, who is the Finnish regulator. And you see now FINREG can see batches owned by all different participants. But most importantly, we want to check batch five because uh, we see batch five and we also see that it's not verified. So I can pull up the details of the batch as the regulator. So this is me doing an inspection. This would be going to the going to PVO's uh, fuel store or something and, and checking that the batch is, is what we say. And then the regulator only has one transaction actually, which is to verify. So then the um, soon this this regulator is going to verify that verify that batch, and we'll see that the status flag will change to being verified by regulator. 
Uh, I'm just showing there that you can order. The, the regulator, of course, can sort batches by batch key or owner and, and so on. There you go. So now I'm verifying batch five. And there you go. Now we can see that batch five has been verified by the regulator. So a little bit to tell you a bit more about behind, well, the underlying workings of Slavka is it's really governed by these, this permissioning system that's available in Hyperledger for different types of information. So the regulator in Slavka has these certain permissions over all batches. So the regulator can query all batches, meaning they can, they can query the blockchain to check what batches are there. Uh, they can do their special regulator transaction, which is to verify a batch. Uh, and they can also, so show origin is also showing the, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, the provenance of the batch. So show origin means that it pulls up the provenance and the history of that batch and everywhere it's been. Um, and only regulators can do that. Uh, so then we have holders. So holders are um, participants like, well, in the Slavka example, they were called PVO and FT Power. And we also have a holder called DGR Org, which is the Deep Geological Repository Organization. And interestingly, you see holders actually have more permissions over batches than regulators. And, and that's a bit novel because the regulator is not all powerful in Slavka. Um, different uh, participants have specific roles and it's really important in Slavka this idea of roles. So it's not really a hierarchy and an authority system. It's more a role-based system. So it's the role of the regulator to query things and verify things and to check the origin of things. And it's the role of holders uh, to transact, say, domestic shipments and foreign shipments and to rebatch. Uh, and the regulator doesn't actually have these um, these permissions because their role is not included in this. And, and this is one of the base, one of the a basis of the um, security of a blockchain system for nuclear safeguards is that there are certain diversion scenarios in nuclear safeguards in which you could in fact have collusion between a national regulator and a, and a state, which the, um, the holders of nuclear material may not necessarily be aware of. But in something like Slavka, that would be incredibly difficult because not only because all of the ledgers are shared and that um, different participants can see if ledgers are updated, but also in in this design of Slavka, the regulator does not in fact have the authority to just unilaterally change inventories of people. So it'd be very hard for that collusion scenario to ever happen. Um, so we split the authority of holders into the authority over owned batches and destined batches. So owned and destined, because it makes a difference, right? Whether you have it or whether it's, uh, whether it, you're the consignee of that batch. So the only permission that a holder has over a destined batch is they can query it. That is, they can see it coming um, and they can receive it when it gets there. That's all they can do with it. So that gives you an idea of the Slavka role system, which is permissions. And then, Slavka also has jurisdictions. Um, so you have a visibility over certain batches. So it go, it go, this sort of the jurisdiction ties in with the roles, um, but it, it defines where you have visibility over batches and also what organizations you can see. So the regulator can see, so, so the regulator actually has a much wider jurisdiction than the holders. Although on the flip side, the holders have a, um, have a more um, a sort of more extensive role in the regulator. The regulator has a much wider jurisdiction than any of the holders, because regulators can see all the MBAs. Um, they can see all the holders, whereas a holder cannot see an MBA that's in someone else's jurisdiction. So that gives you an idea of these two, like these two opposing um, ways of setting up a regulatory system in Slavka. And the result of using these roles and jurisdictions to set up a regulatory system is, is you end up with a structure which is really quite different to um, current reporting structures. So currently, um, for safeguards reporting anyway, so 
so holders of nuclear material or participants in the supply chain will report their inventories up to a national regulator um, who will then report that up to an international regulator. So this would be Atomic Energy Agency. And this whole thing is, is very hierarchical and vertically arranged. In Slavka, it can be quite different, okay, because um, the ledgers are shared. So in spite of having very clear uh, permission over what you can see um, everyone actually has all the data so you don't need to you don't need to send the data to anyone you just need to reveal it at the right time and that means that you don't end up with such a hierarchical system you end up with more of a flat kind of network um, in which people transact nuclear materials between each other and these transactions are then observed by the regulators rather than being so actively um, sort of reported to and logged by the regulators. And, and so it's rather different. And that's, that's an interesting discussion point, which I think has many implications. So in terms of reflecting on how we've been applying DLT and safeguards, well, here's a few reflections. So the first one, Assuring security of reports made to the Atomic Energy Agency. We think it's probably no better than um, secure web connections, but on the other hand, it's probably no worse either. Um, and you have to remember that a lot of reporting um, between holders of nuclear material and regulators and the Atomic Energy Agency even today still occurs by email. <laughs> so this is not necessarily any worse or better. Um, well, could be considerably better actually than email, but um, maybe um, at least as good as a secure web connection. Uh, and it relies on this, to some people, slightly unsettling idea that you must share your data with other participants, uh, however, in encrypted form. So it does rely on cryptography, but being realistic about conventional internet um, transfer of data, that also relies on cryptography. So it's not really inherently any different. Um, so the second point, assurance of integrity of reports made to the IAEA. There's, this is something I explained earlier. So the additional involvement of peers mitigates against some scenarios in which a proliferator could try to hide diversion by manipulating records. That's definitely true where you have a immutable and shared ledger. It really does mitigate against some scenarios. So one of our outcomes of use, making Slumbat and Slavka was showing compatibility with the model subsidiary arrangement code 10. This is a blueprint for how um, states should report their nuclear material inventories to the Atomic Energy Agency. And it seems obvious now, but when we started out, it wasn't clear whether we would be able to make a blockchain system that was actually compatible with code 10. It turns out that was one of the easier things to achieve. Uh, it probably leads to reduced demands on, well, no, not probably, almost certainly leads to reduced demands for transit matching, because as I said, batches are actually instantiated on the blockchain and they are not fungible, which means that every time you do a transaction, there is a, a kind of transit matching enforced um, for that transaction. You can't, you can't avoid it because you can only give somebody something that you own on, when you're using blockchain transactions. And finally, uh, regarding deep geological repositories, shared ledgers would facilitate long-term information storage for things like materials in DGRs because they're immutable, because they're distributed, and because you can have more than one custodian of the data but you can still maintain trust between those custodians that they're unable to make any changes. So I said in my abstract that I was gonna talk about um, extending this idea, which we started with nuclear material tracking to sources, because the two systems have many parallels. One in, so, the safeguard system is for nuclear safeguards. Source tracking and licensing is more about nuclear safety and nuclear security. So that's the top row here. The licensee wants, sorry, whoops. Um, the licensee, never mind, I won't try and cross it out, just leave it. The licensee wants to demonstrate um, non diversion of material in uh, nuclear safeguards. 
whereas they want to demonstrate safety and security with source tracking and licensing. So the state regulator in the case of safeguards wants to, wants to verify the absence of undeclared activities. The state regulator in source tracking wants to demonstrate or verify custodianship and best practice and nuclear safety over those sources. So both of these areas, both of these areas have their individual challenges. So we addressed some of the challenges of nuclear safeguards by building SLAFCA. So increasing efficiency, transit matching and improved information sharing. Um, what are the challenges in source tracking and licensing? That would be an interesting discussion to have actually in the next 20 minutes or so. I'd be really interested to hear what some of the um, attendees might think about what their current challenges are for tracking sources and licensing in, in Australia. Uh, but some that I came up with is that maybe um, combining medical with nuclear regulatory oversight, uh, dosimetry and radiation safety. And also, I think in Australia, for sure, the idea of having many regulators is a challenge because sometimes you find yourself reporting a source to the state regulator, the federal regulator, um, the, medical, the medical goods regulator, the TGA. Um, and so that's challenging. It's, there's a lot of duplicated work. Okay, uh, so after this little comparison slide, let's, let's wonder about what if you use DLT for tracking sources? It might be interesting. So we think that DLT for tracking, so that DLT, did I say it's distributed ledger technology? I think I did say it's not, so it's different. Uh, sometimes you call it blockchain, sometimes you call it DLT. Okay, DLT may add value lower down the regulator batch hierarchy for um, uh, source tracking. So it's not so much the concern of international regulators. It's more the concern of um, a state regulator with their, with the holders and the batches in their jurisdiction. One thing you could do if you were combining DLT with source tracking is it would be extremely feasible and uh, practical to link transaction logic to attributes of the batches and the facilities. So potentially you could have a system that's um, in which certain sources uh, could be shipped to certain facilities or would not be able to be shipped to other facilities which perhaps not licensed to receive them. And it also creates a definitive shared ledger of information even though you may have multiple regulators because in fact everybody would be using the same ledger. They'd have their own copy so you could imagine where um, a state regulator and a national regulator could have their own copy of the ledger, but they would have absolute confidence that it was that it was the same. And they would also have confidence that other participants couldn't modify it without them without their without them taking part in uh, verifying those transactions. And finally, um, yes, we can set permissions and visibility of transactions and batches among, among trusted participants. So that's the idea of um, roles and jurisdictions, which are um, almost part of the system when you think about a private blockchain for storing this kind of information. So, ah, yes. So that's my, my animation. I'm adding in, so, I'm, I'm suggesting that whereas our safeguards tool only includes regulator holder and batch, um, in the, something more like a source tracking version, you could include facilities and locations in a more detailed way um, than we currently do for nuclear safeguards because safeguards are just tracked down to the KMP level. So finally, oh, oops, and there we go. I'm making the point that we have regulator A and regulator B in there as well. So finally, what are we doing now with Slavka? So the, the Finnish project was, was great, um, but it's finished. Haha, <laughs> that was a joke, wasn't it? <laughs> um, what are we going to do now? Um, well, I've still got, we, we st we're still working on Slavka at, at UNSW. And at the moment, our, one of our um, projects is to connect Slavka to um, more tangible things like a counter or a detector in the real world because a question we've always had when presenting Slavka to people is how do I know the data on the blockchain is true and of course the answer is you don't you have to check it um, but we're imagining could you have something which in a secure way could verify 
um, that data that was held on the on the Slavka blockchain. So what would this look like? Um, so this is this is a development version of Slavka, and you see we've got a new we've got a um, a new option here, a new tab. It's measurements. So this is uh, a video just showing Slavka being used to measure as well. So you'd have a, you could have a batch, and then imagine that um, you could detect a change in the activity of a certain batch, and that may signify something. Uh, or if you knew the half-life of the batch, which of course you do, then you could check if there was inconsistencies in the measurements um, uh, in comparison to the half-life of that source. And then you may want to go and review that. So this is the kind of things regulators could do. And that's the end. So, so thank you everyone for listening to my webinar. I hope we have some good discussion. And uh, thank you also to my collaborators who help with this work. Um, we're very grateful and um, we hope for more interesting things in the future. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Ed. Uh, that was an extremely interesting talk. Uh, I've got actually questions, but what I might do is uh, ask on behalf of some of our attendees the questions that Dave they have uh, at the moment, but four of them. So first question, uh, without further ado, Recognizing, the first question is recognizing that radioactive sources are part of a global supply chain. Do you consider that blockchain technology might be too high a bar for application in developing countries? Um, well, we're, um, we're leaping into the future here, aren't we? We're saying that um, everyone's going to use blockchain technology. That would be fun. Uh, that would be wonderful. Everyone can use Slavka. Uh, but assuming that there are no barriers to that other than technology, um, no, I don't think it would be a problem really because we we are just talking about software. This is not, I mean, it's it's advanced software. It's high technology in software land, but for the user, it's it's just software. So I, yeah. yeah, I think that would be okay in developing countries. I mean, for instance, uh, mobile phones are so prevalent now. You can find them in so-called countries. Would you be able to implement this technology on a mobile phone somewhere in oh. Africa, for example? Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, there's no... Okay, so you can't store an awful lot of information on a mobile phone. And I'm not sure... Would you, would you want your whole ledger of nuclear materials on somebody's mobile phone? Um Perhaps you wouldn't actually use a mobile phone as a node to store a copy of the ledger, but in terms of accessing the ledger, then of course, yeah, that's. That, I think that's relatively straightforward. That's, that's cool. All right, so the second question is, uh, how does, say, a regulator conduct physical verification activities and possibly modify or correct the record for a blockchain entry or sequence if new com information comes to light? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, well, you you conduct an inspection and a physical verification currently. So in current Slavka, just like you would with any other system, you know, like you like you would with Numbat or like you would with Safka, you you'd have to go there and look at the batch. That's that's all you can do. Um, in terms of making changes, because I know this is this is a real problem that regulators have is um, updating things is in Slavka, um, you can change anything, right? It's not, so anything which is within your role to change, you can change. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. It's just that every change you make will be logged as a transaction. So it really is like having a paper-based accounting record where you cannot go back and rub something out. You have to append a new entry saying remeasurement or something and then enter a new weight for that batch. And that's perfectly okay. It's not that you can't do that. It's just that it would be uh, an official logged transaction just like all the other transactions. Cool. Um, and also, so I guess another question coming is, uh, can new properties be added? I guess you just answered that. Uh, another question is, uh, would distributed ledger technology uh, still be secure uh, once 
say, you know, quantum computers become available. I'm guessing the the person asking this question is asking basically when you've got super powerful computers, which might be able to crack the cryptography that drives the, the technology. What do you think? Like, do you think it's going to make a difference? Oh, I think it would make an enormous difference. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I, I think sharing an encrypted database with somebody if they have a quantum computer is probably not secure. But um, is sending it over the internet secure? I think it's equally scary. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, so let's see. Uh, another good question was, uh, could the application allow for inputs from, say, a QR code generating device? Yes, absolutely. So this is this is what we're getting at in this IoT extension to Slavka. So the, we're working on something now to use a, a detector linked up to Slavka, but that could easily that could equally be a barcode scanner or a QR generator. There, there is a bit of a challenge with all of these IoT devices: is that the device itself becomes part of the trust chain. Um, so you need to be careful about what you include and really the dev i think my current feeling is the device probably has to come from a trusted um provider so take for example the uh, in safeguards where the atomic energy agency may supply seals or may supply a remote monitoring device um because that that device becomes part of the the chain um so we would have to work in a similar way but assuming that you had a trusted device then yes, it could absolutely um, place data onto the blockchain. Okay. Well, I mean, because following up on those, one of the statements from one of the uh, attendees here is that uh, both our PANZA and CSR are going to be exploring QR code systems for tracking dispatch and receipt of sources, which is a good opportunity for integrating, you know, their technology into this, this technology. I guess that's a discussion between you and a PANZA and CSR possibly. Um, so, so another question was, uh, how were the rules of participation in the system determined and were they written by the all powerful yourself, you know, the developer or <laughs> the developer, yeah. no, I, I can see the question. I can see the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, for, for Slumbat, they were determined by code 10 and to some extent by the all powerful Dr. Robert and his student. For Slavka, which is the one I've mostly been talking about, which is the extension of Slumbat, they were actually they were determined largely by Stuck, by the national regulator, because we, um, you know, we sent them updates. We kept on building the software and showing them what it was doing, and they would come back with, you know, comments saying, "Oh no, we don't want that transaction to work like that. We want it to." You know, we want the transaction to work in some other way. So actually, I think for Slavka, the regulator probably had quite a large role in determining the rules of the system. Right, that makes sense. Cool. Okay, so so those are kind of questions. This is a question for myself. Like whilst I was listening into your uh, presentation, I was thinking about, you know, of course, with any system you're developing, you're going to start up uh, small, you know, like assuming kind of uh, simpler, a uh, more simpler, a simpler kind of uh, uh, picture of, of what's going on, but or, 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 I mean, immediately I was thinking about, you know, when you're saying, when you have some nuclear materials going from uh, a source or, or a, an entity that generates, new, uh, I mean, works with nuclear materials, and then it's transiting to a repository, say, uh, there, there is, you know, it's not like a digital world when we're living in a, a physical world, it, it has to transit. And then in that period when it's transiting, there is this kind of gray area of who, who has responsibility at that point in time? Would it be like uh, the people doing the transportation? And, and does that mean that they could possibly be a new uh, uh, entity to partake in this system? Yeah, yeah, they could. I mean, of course they could. You could, you could have a participant who is a transport provider and they could take ownership or cust they could be custodians of batches when they're in transport. But in, in, in practice, safeguards doesn't really work like that because the the time requirement for reporting changes in nuclear safeguards, well, it varies depending on what the material is, but very often you don't actually have to report a change in inventory like the moment it occurs. It's not, it's not really a real-time system. Um, so 
when something's in transport, it's still the it's still the responsibility of the shipper. Right. Um, okay. And there's not actually a need. There's not actually a legal or regulatory need to report where something is right now. Um, so it's it's right. an important distinction is that we we made Slavka to be um, a nuclear material accounting and reporting tool. It's not a supply chain management tool. It, and it kind of blurs the boundaries, but whenever we came up with one of these sort of discussions like, oh, like what you're talking about, Mark, we were careful to always fall back on the side is that, no, this is just a reporting tool. It's not, it's not this real time supply chain management thing. Yep. Um, I know blockchain is often used for that, but um, we stopped short of that. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, another question, I mean, two more questions came in. I'll just read them out for the, for the audience. Uh, with the potential for Australia to, in the future, potentially have a national radioactive waste management facility, could these records be useful to establish the safety uh, status of existing deposit of inventories uh, without physical attendance? Uh, yes, I mean, because it's a definitive record of what's there. That's the that's the important thing. I, I, it's it is just a record, right? It's not. Um, it's it doesn't it doesn't include any monitoring unless you um, explicitly design in a monitoring function as well. Um, but in so far as having very secure and long term stable records, then sort of helps that goal of establishing safety of um, nuclear nuclear waste in a repository, then yeah, this helps enormously. And that's why that that's why the Finnish regulator is interested in it. Because they've, you know, they they have this challenge on the horizon of of managing this big nuclear spent fuel repository at Okiluto. Okay. So I've got a, a quite detailed question here. It sounds like uh, from someone who's in, in in the business. So the question was, uh, you mentioned public trust as a key element of the safeguards regime. Do you see any potential for distributed verification and transaction validation increasing uh, the public trust in safeguards, etc.? So like Ethereum to verify the ELC20 smart uh, contract, uh, or does a permission-based system preclude public involvement? Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure. So yeah, did I say that public trust was an element of the safeguards regime? Not sure if I did. Um, trust, trust is an element, is a key element of the safeguards regime, but I don't think it really involves the public. Uh, it's more right. trust between regulators, license holders, and international, the international regulator, and between states. I guess you can say, if, if you say that trust between states, as in national states, I don't mean states of a country like Australia, I mean states with a capital S in the context of the IAEA. Um, if you say trust between states depends on trust between their respective publics, um, then yeah, it does depend on public trust, but I, safeguards is quite a closed shop. Um, however, so, Okay, I'm kind of negating the question at the beginning. Um, but later on, when we say, where, where is it? Uh, does a permission-based system preclude public involvement? No, it doesn't, because you can specify that certain information is publicly available. Um, I, I can actually, so yeah, you could do that. I can see this actually being more valuable for nuclear safety. Um, because public trust really is a problem for nuclear safety, I, I think. Um, so, hmm. yeah. It's interesting because um, the, the question of trust, because of course, you know, you don't want to tell everyone exact, everyone out there exactly where everything is at any point in time, approximately even. But yet, you know, the public ought to trust the, the regulator and all the safeguards office to, to know exactly what they're doing, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's the interesting um, opposition, right, between safeguards and security. So in the interests of safeguards, everything would be public because 
the easiest way to demonstrate that you're not diverting anything to non-peaceful purposes is just to make absolutely everything public. Mm. But that is impractical given that there are also nuclear security requirements uh, to protect sources and nuclear facilities from from malicious action. So then you have this, there's actually this tension between nuclear safeguards and nuclear security. And that's that's another reason why things like this blockchain technology is interesting because it it allows you to re resolve this tension maybe in in ways that are somehow more granular and more um, more graded than than just the hierarchical regulatory approach right okay um i think we're coming up to 6 p.m there, there are actually a couple of more questions flowing in but um maybe i can you can just take them on notice and, and get Yeah, I don't mind. I can stick, I can answer them. I mean, it's, there's no, there's right. no room booking, is there? <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. It's up to you, Mark. But if you, if you feel that we should shut that, I don't know. Okay. Um, well, let me just, just double check the chat. So, so another question was that, is there a technical limit to the amount of characteristics and, and data that can be appended? To a transaction or uh th there is a practical limit to how much data you can store actually on the blockchain and hash to create that connection between blocks um it really depends on how many blocks you're creating and how fast you're creating them so you can imagine if each block was a few kilobytes and you've got gigabytes of storage available, well, then it's not a problem, is it? But if you start talking about putting hundreds of megabytes into blocks, then it's probably a little bit too much. Um, however, the, the system I had early on in my presentation shows that you can use the blockchain to store hashes of data stored somewhere else. So that gives you a way to verify the integrity of other data that is too big to store on the blockchain itself. So in that, I would include I would include things like video feed or like very extensive physical measurements that may take up, like I said, hundreds of megabytes. In, in which case, you would probably reference them by hashing to the blockchain, um, even though like you may not store that data itself there. Right. Okay. Um, I guess and another question was: uh, Could a group of holders decide to use blockchain or equipment or source uh, slash source tracking before the regulator does and then invite the regulator to, to participate. <laughs> sure they would. Sure they could, right? You could do anything. Um, but I don't, it's going to be hard to persuade the regulator to take part if they weren't part of the initial designing of the rules, I think. I think, I think any national regulator would, would want to be there from the beginning um, to to put in place what they considered to be the right procedures. Because that's what this does. That's what something like Slavka does, is it codes the rules. So, so the chain code, which makes up the smart contracts, um, is effectively coding regulatory rules. And so I think that needs to be um, done right at the beginning. Okay, I think um, we've exhausted the question. Sorry, one last question. Uh, how do we get in contact with you for further information? Uh, UNSW, Google me, or my, my email address is um, e.obard at unsw.edu.au. Okay. Or through the ANA. Sorry, I should, of course, through the ANA. That's, what, that's where we are, isn't it? You get in touch sure. with me through the ANA. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think that was a very really uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Ed um, and, Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I think we've got all that uh, on video, and we will be distributing this uh, soon. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. Yeah. And and thanks to all four our participants in the audience. Uh, we will continue on with our series of webinars in the future. Um, and uh, everyone keeps safe and good night. Yep. Bye. <laughs> good night. <laughs>